Brent, this is a red panda? Correct. I always think of pandas as the big black and white bears. Giant pandas are. These are red pandas. Oh, those are giant pandas. These guys come from the mountains in the Himalayas. And they're a bamboo feeder also. These guys will eat thousands of bamboo leaves a day. And they love this weather. So this is the best time to come to the zoo and see them. Yeah. Snow leopards are one of the rarest big cats in the world. These guys are hunters in high elevations. That gray coat blends into the rock work that they hunt in. And they just love this snowy weather here. Visiting the zoo in the winter is so fun, but after exploring in the cold, chilly air, I definitely need to warm up. Off to the reptile house. Here we are in the reptile house. And the first thing I notice, Brent, is that it's warm in here. Can you tell us about the reptiles we have here? This is, this is one of the other things that makes the zoo a fun place to go to in the winter. We've got a great place for you to come in and warm up. Reptiles are cold-blooded. They don't produce a body temperature, so we have to keep them warm. Go out, you walk around the zoo and it's cold, you come in here and warm up and get to see some really cool animals. That's for sure. Reptiles are snakes, lizards, turtles, and we also have some amphibians in here, so we have poison dart frogs. And our reptiles go from an 18-foot reticulated python wow. down to smaller reptiles. I noticed the largest exhibit in this room is the Komodo dragon right behind us. Just the name Komodo dragon gets me excited. Tell us about this beautiful creature you have here. Dragons have fascinated people for, throughout history. They are found in Asian culture, they're found in European culture. Um, the Komodo dragons come from a series of islands off of Indonesia, and they're only found on those islands, which is what makes them so rare. Look at that tongue. So big. Yeah. They are one of the largest lizards in the world. They get to be 10 feet long, and they weigh 200 pounds. Wow. They're, they're a massive animal, and they're just fascinating. When I think of dragons, I think of fire-breathing creatures that fly down from the sky. Why do we think of dragons like that? Well, Komodo dragons don't fly, but they do have a red tongue. And some of the theory is that uh -huh. when they would flick that red tongue out there, that was where the fire-breathing legends came from. And so that's... That makes a lot of sense. All, all these legends have some sort of basis in, in something that people saw or heard at some point. Wow, the Komodo dragon is awesome. One of the other exhibits we have here is a reticulated python. Snake. She's almost 18 feet long and 135 wow. pounds. Wow. You're not going to find a snake that big in a pet store, huh? Hopefully not. <laughs> Hopefully not. Why so dangerous? Well, she's a constrictor, and her teeth are a little bit over half an inch long, so when she attacks, she'll grab you, pull you in her coils, and then constrict. Wow. And, and constrict means? They, her, her body goes around you and stops your ribs from moving, which stops your lungs from moving. So they just you squeeze suffocate. away. Squeeze and squeeze and squeeze. Doesn't break bones, usually, but stops your lungs from moving. Wow. Scary, but cool. People either love snakes or they're terrified of them. Either way, they are fascinating creatures. Tell us a little bit about them. 
Yes, they are fascinating. I think that the people are afraid of snakes because they're so different than we are. They don't yeah. have arms and legs, they don't have eyelids, they don't have hair. So the legends of snakes staring you down, they don't have eyelids, they can't blink their eyes. Right. So that's different than we are. And anything that's different than we are is something that's a little bit strange or scary for us. Yeah, that's true. They don't have hands that they can use, so they have to swallow their food items whole. Reticulated pythons are also the longest species of snake in the world and have been reported up to 33 feet. Wow. So she's 18 feet, that's almost twice as big as she is right now. And the name reticulated comes from the pattern on the back. It's a web-like design, hmm. and it's good camouflage for her. She's an ambush predator. She sits and waits for a food item to come past, and then we'll reach out and grab it. She's not likely to chase something down. Right. Patience. So, Brent, most of the exhibits we've seen here have one kind of animal in one exhibit. But behind us, we have something special. We have many different species of animals all living together in harmony. Tell us about this exhibit and what we can find here. This is our Asian forest exhibit, and that's exactly what we're trying to show. Animals don't live by themselves. So in this exhibit, we have three different species of birds, two different species of turtle, and a lizard. And that's what you could find if you were in a forest in Asia. We have a pair of white-crested laughing thrushes. We have Ballymynus. Which Wait, say that again? White-crested laughing thrush. It's laughing thrush? Laughing thrush. Does that mean they laugh? They make a lot of noise. <laughs> sort of like a blue jay. That, that personality, that attitude. Got it. And we have crested wood partridges, and we have Ballymynus. Cool. And the Ballymynus are an endangered species. Huh. And now, is that a minor bird, the kind of bird that sings and talks back? Same family. Same different, family. Different species, though. Got it. These guys are all white with blue masks. Uh-huh. And then we have elongated tortoises and spiny hill turtles and a prehensile-tailed skink. This is so exciting. I am suiting up here and getting ready to feed the sea turtles. Come on, let's go. All right. All right, so you're going to face me on your way down. Two hands. Step at a time, perfect. All right, well, here we are. We are actually floating on top of the Ocean Realm exhibit. And behind me, I can see sharks, stingrays, fish, and actually the largest creature in this tank sea turtles. And I'm here with my friend Carrie, and she's going to tell us about these amazing creatures right here behind me. Carrie, tell me about the sea turtles. 
While there are seven species of sea turtles in the ocean, we have two of them actually right here in Ocean Realm. Carrie, where can we find sea turtles? Uh, sea turtles are gonna be found anywhere where the water's a little bit warmer, in the Atlantic, and the Pacific. So Carrie, tell me exactly what kind of sea turtles we have here in this exhibit. Here in Ocean Realm, we have two kinds of sea turtles. There are seven that are out in the ocean. One of them's called the green sea turtle, and one of them's called the loggerhead sea turtle. So what makes a green sea turtle a green sea turtle? Green sea turtles actually are have green fat in their bodies because they eat turtle breasts, which is green, so it makes them green fat. That makes sense. And the other turtle was called? The loggerhead sea turtle. And why are they called a loggerhead They have turtle? a very, very large, broad head is why they call them loggerhead sea turtles. Huh. So when I think of sea turtles, or turtles in general really, I think of them as old and slow moving and kind of the wise creatures of the world. Is there truth to that? They are old. They can get to be up to 40 to 100 years old is wow. what they've seen. And when they're swimming, they do move relatively slow because they're so big, right? They do. How big do they actually get? Well, some can reach up to 1,000 pounds. Wow. However, ours are about 350 to 400 pounds. Are you guys ready? We are going to feed the sea turtles. Come on. So I know that fish can swim under the water for as long as they want because they breathe underwater. With gills. But turtles have a special way of breathing. They breathe just like you and I. Yes, they do. Right? Tell they me have, about that. They, they have lungs just like you and I, and they can go down underwater and sleep for a certain amount of time, and then just like you and I, they need to come up for breath. So they actually hold their breath and sleep underwater? They do. For how long can they last underwater? I think it's probably about Three to 10 minutes they can usually sleep underwater. What has made these sea turtles endangered? Well, Alex, a lot of things are making them endangered. A few of them, fishermen are catching them in their nets and they're getting injured that way. Pollution can injure them through get, ingesting anything. Also littering, garbage, they get soda wrappers wrapped around their head and they can suffocate. That's why it's so important not to pollute. It can help save these beautiful creatures of the sea. This is my friend Mary, and she's gonna tell us a little bit about what we can find in the shark tank. Well, welcome, Alex. I'm so happy to see you here. So behind me in this shark tank, there are three different types of sharks. We have sandbar, sand tiger, and nurse sharks. Now, when I think of sharks, the first thing I think about is that big mouth and those really sharp teeth. Exactly. They do need teeth so they can eat just like me and you do, Alex. These guys like to eat fish. That's typically what we feed them here at Adventure Aquarium. A shark, depending on the species, they can have between 100 to 300 teeth. Our sharks in our shark realm, they typically lose one tooth a day. So they can typically go through 20,000 to 30,000 teeth in a lifetime. Wow, almost 300 teeth in one shark mouth. Tell me a little bit about those fins that we always associate with the shark. I can tell the difference between them is if I look at their dorsal fins, and those are the fins that you're seeing when you're on your boat. So we can tell the different sharks apart by looking at their fins. Exactly. Our sandbar sharks, they have two different size dorsal fins, and then our sand tiger sharks, they have the same size dorsal fins. I heard there's an amazing hammerhead shark here at the Adventure Aquarium. Now, most sharks have that pointy kind of snout, but a hammerhead shark is different. We do have two species, the bonnethead and the great hammerhead. The great hammerhead, um, his face is called a cephalofoil. And are their eyes actually on the sides of their head? Exactly. Why? It actually helps them being able to see a lot better. They have a bigger range of view. What does the hammerhead like to eat? Stingrays. Stingrays, wow. Do you feed them live stingrays? We actually do not feed them stingrays. We feed them fish, also uh, large pieces of squid as well. Cool. There are many different types of sharks, and one of the best ways to identify them is to look at the colors and patterns on their skin. What makes each shark actually have different colors, whether it's 
polka dots or stripes. It helps them just blend into their surroundings. That way bigger sharks or something else won't try to eat them. Now can you tell us a little bit about their bones and what makes them be able to wiggle and move so smoothly? Their skeleton is made out of cartilage, so like the wiggly parts of your nose. It helps them be able to bend and twist and move when going after their prey. Hmm. Well, it certainly looks like that when you watch them. Next up on our sea life adventure is a visit to the Stingray Beach Club. So what do we have here? Welcome to Stingray Beach Club, Alex. Awesome. There are 200 species of stingrays. Some live in saltwater, some live in freshwater. We have four amazing saltwater species in our exhibit here today. Can I touch these? Exactly, just two fingers along their backs. Here they come. Oh, I got it spin. <laughs> They're kind of slimy. Exactly. That slime actually helps eliminate slack, so it actually makes it a little bit easier for them to swim in the water. It looks like they're flying. It does look like they're flying. They move their wings up and down, kind of like a bird. Yeah, look at that. They're flapping away. Such a unique shape. The ones that are round and flat, they typically hang out at the bottom of the ocean where it's really sandy. Yeah. But then our cow nose rays, the ones that are shaped kind of more like a kite, those guys like to hang out more in the middle of the water column, so they will keep moving. It looks like that's the biggest one you have in here. You're absolutely correct. He is our leopard whip tail ray. Whoop! <laughs> <laughs> now, he is literally covered in leopard spots. You got it. Those leopard spots actually help him blend into his surroundings, just like the sharks that touch a shark. Right. What do these guys eat? That's a good question, Alex. They like to eat things like crustaceans, so like a crab or fish. OK, well, look at them. They definitely do like to splash, just like we would if we were out in the ocean or in a swimming pool. Yeah. He's giving me a high five. <laughs> he just came right up to me. <laughs> Let's see if we can do a high five with the stingray. Oh, I think maybe this one. High five! <laughs> Do they sting with that tail or what? How does that help them swim? What's it there for? So their tail is used so they can kind of navigate around in the water. They sting with something that's called a barb. It um, comes to a point and it's serrated on both sides. They don't go out and hunt with it. They use it just sheer protection. Most times when humans get stung by a stingray, it's when we accidentally step on them. Right. So we typically get our injuries from our foot, our ankle, or our legs. But I have never been stung by one of these stingrays before. Do they have teeth in those mouths? They do have teeth. These guys actually grind up their food. Stingrays are at the top of my list for favorite creatures. On my way to the Touch a Shark exhibit, where I'll be able to touch and feel these amazing sea creatures. <laughs> so, Mary, this looks so exciting. Where are we right now? We are right now. We are in, um, at Touch a Shark. Touch a Shark. That's right. Touch a Shark. Ah! You're not a fish, are you? I'm definitely not a fish. Well, then you have nothing to worry about. The water's kind of warm, and I've got my two fingers. I'm about to touch the shark. Whoa. Wow. It feels kind of like sandpaper. That's correct, Alex. They are covered in little teeny tiny little teeth. They're called dermal denticles. Little teeth? Wow. So this one is all brown, and the one next to it is covered in stripes. Are they two different kinds of sharks? Exactly. So the one you were touching is called a Mexican horn shark, and her friend laying next to her is a white spotted bamboo shark. All right, so they're about this long. And you said these are fully grown sharks. Exactly. So they're not going to get much bigger than this. Nope, only 20% of sharks actually get bigger than us humans. Most of them are either our size or smaller. So where can we find these sharks in the wild? Certainly. So our white spotted bamboo sharks and our brown banded bamboo sharks, you can find them in coastal waters in Indonesia, Thailand, and um, Japan. Far away from here, huh? Far away from here. And how about this brown shark? Where can you find sure, him? Our Mexican horn shark, you can find her in the Western Pacific.
These guys are icons. This is when you think about a wild North American animal, this is what you think. And these guys just love this weather. They run, they play. When we were walking up to this exhibit, I noticed they came running towards us. And the first thing I noticed was their eyes, their yellow eyes just staring right at us. Tell me about those eyes. And I think that's one of the things that, that people think of when they think of wolves. It's a haunting, piercing stare when yeah. they look at you. It's intimidating, it's scary, it's exciting, it's visual. Um, they, they watch the people as much as we watch them. And that's what it seems like. And on a day like this, when there's not a lot of visitors here, we're a unique thing for them, so they'll come out and look at us. Yeah. On a busy summer day, they'll be asleep in the shade. Well, I know I love my dogs, and people say a dog is a man's best friend, but a wolf, who's a wolf's best friend? A wolf is another wolf's best friend. That's what I thought. They're, they're a pack animal. They live in groups. They, they don't belong in a household. They're, they're a wild animal. is amazing. Yeah! Llamas! Leopard! Pig! Cow! Sheep! Penguin Island. Standing about 12 inches high, these African penguins are one of 17 penguin species. A species is a group of animals that are similar to each other. Of the 17 species of penguins in the world, only seven live where it's cold. And the African penguins are not one of them. So here we are at the aquarium uh, with my friend Jen. And Jen, what do we have here? These are two of our juvenile uh, African or black-footed penguins. Will they turn black and white at some point? Absolutely. This is uh, their second set of feathers, um, and this is what we call their juvenile plumage. So when they first hatch out of their egg, they have very soft down feathers that are not waterproof. Um, right around, say, about three months of age, which is what these guys are, um, they're going to lose, they're going to molt. All those little soft downy feathers are going to fall off, and this sort of silver coloration is gonna come in. These feathers are waterproof, and this is when mom and dad would start encouraging them to come down to the ocean, uh, learning how to swim, and starting to find food on their own. So they all keep this particular plumage till they're somewhere between a year, year and a half, and then they'll grow in new feathers that are the more typical black and white that you think of for penguins. Right. And at that time, they'd be considered an adult penguin. So penguins are birds, correct? Yes, penguins are a bird, although they are a little bit different because they cannot fly. Uh, penguins are uh, very good swimmers, so they sort of fly through the, through the water. Right, and their wings here seem to look almost like flippers. They do use their wings to power them through the water, and then they, they lay their feet out behind them, so they'll use their feet and their tail to kind of help them steer. They do have an oil gland at the base of their tail, 
and it helps them to be waterproof. It's kind of hidden right back here. And they'll collect the oil from that area and they'll spread it all around on their feathers. It just helps with the water to bead right off. What do these African penguins eat? Uh, they are predominantly fish eaters, but they do eat some different types of invertebrates. In Africa, one of their main food sources would be sardines. We tried to offer our colony sardines and they didn't really appreciate them so much. So we feed the majority of their food is capelin, and then we also offer herring and squid. This is so cool. Thank you, Jen, for sharing. You're very welcome. Nice with to have us you. And letting us know about these African penguins. Thanks. stop on our aquarium adventure is a visit with the frogs. Unlike many of the sea animals we've seen today who live in salt water, frogs live in ponds, lakes, and marshes. Frogs belong to a group of animals called amphibians. Amphibians are animals that spend part of their lives in water and part on land. My favorite thing about a frog is its tongue. A frog throws its sticky tongue out of its mouth to catch an insect and then snaps it back inside. 
not exactly how humans use their tongues to eat. We need our tongues to chew, swallow, talk, taste, even sing. So Brent, tell us about these amazing bison here in the zoo. These are one of the largest land animals in North America. They used to roam the, the western United States in herds of thousands. The zoo experience in the winter is very different than the zoo experience in the summer. Animals that we have out year round are animals that can take this kind of climate. So they have that big shaggy coat. Now are they eating these Christmas trees? They'll eat a little bit of it. We give them hay and hay is their staple diet. The trees are something that they um, they play with and they beat up. But um, I was going to so say, I mean, it looks like they're actually just playing. I was really surprised at how big they actually were. These are full grown. It's a male and two females. The male's the one on the left hand side, larger animal, bigger hump in the back, larger horns. The two females are in there on the right. Yeah, so I noticed they have this incredible fur. They have large hooves. They have a giant head. And on top of their head are these massive horns. Who are they defending themselves from? What are the predators of the bison in the wild? Wolves. Wolves. How much do they actually weigh, full grown? About a 1,000 pounds. A 1,000 pounds. Wow, that's like half a car. Yep. They're a big animal. They're a strong animal, so we're very careful when we work with them. If I saw a bison in the wild, I would not want to get close to it. Not want to get close to it, not want to get out of your car. Yeah, which is another great reason why visiting a zoo is so awesome. Because we get to stand so close and we're safe and protected and we can see this amazing creature up close. So cool. Many animals adapt in amazing ways to survive in the wild. For some, their skin or fur can act as camouflage, so they blend right into their environment. Here in the Eat and Be Eaten exhibition, this is all about the food chain, who eats who and who sometimes gets eaten by who. In here, we have the red-foot tortoises. These guys are native to South America, and they love to eat all different kinds of fruit. It is their absolute favorite food. And if you see in here, there's also some golden finches flying around. These guys are the Degus. They live in central Chile and down in South America and that live way high up in the mountains. They're kind of like a gerbil that you might see in the pet store. One of these very silly things about these guys, they love to store food in their cheeks. So their cheeks get big and puffy as they collect all different kinds of seeds and nuts. In here, we see the burrfish. And just like other members in the pufferfish family, if they get threatened or scared at all, they can puff up into a huge ball to scare off anybody who might want to make a snack out of them. And you can see all those sharp spines all over their back would make them a very unappetizing meal. So these are our Madagascar hissing cockroaches. Now these are very different than the cockroaches you'd see in the city garbage cans. I these hope so. guys, Exactly. These guys love to live in dark, moldy old logs and wedge themselves in and eat old bits of vegetation. You saw we Look just gave them. Coming. There, they're coming out. Oh, Soup's on. <laughs> these are the newest addition to our Liberty Science Center family, the cotton top tamarins. These wonderful little monkeys, they're extremely vocal. They have many different sounds that they use to communicate within their family. That's one of my favorite parts about these monkeys. They stick together in big family groups. And when it's time to have a baby, all of the grown-ups in the entire family take care of the little baby all together. 